Bible smack. Got a bought a new Bible just the other day, or just today. It's the uh, it's an old Thompson's. Okay, they're decent, but um, nevertheless, um, today I'm going to go over some ideas that I wrote in my latest blog. What makes the KJV special? Now, um, I posted this. I got plenty of people reading it, but not any interaction. Um, one guy did interact, like, within less than 60 seconds, he started, you know, smearing it. <laughs> yeah. But um, as far as, you know, real, you know, constructive thought, um, nothing. And even, like, some friends who would, seemed pretty agreeable, just didn't really feel like, you know, responding, so <laughs> I figured I'd go ahead and just talk about this. I kind of feel like this could be, you know, some ideas that build up a major reconciliation with the issue. Now, as I go over that, um, I've come to the point where, uh, like, you know, I hit like kind of like a prime probably around 2017, and um, it it was for deeply spiritual purposes. It, it's it was an issue that kind of haunted me. Um, it was horrible when I first dealt with it. Probably when I was like maybe 19 or so. Then like. But, you know, I didn't have strict theology anyway, right? Then, um, you know, really had to kind of hunker down back to this subject around 2006. And then wrote up a uh, rough draft manuscript around 2009. Uh, fairly quickly, this was just my growth as a Christian and a desire to follow God rightly, you know, um, and I've told my testimony about stuff like that in the past. I was a new version guy, and then, you know, slowly got around to all this stuff. But, nevertheless, um, there's, um, you know, I think Nick Sayers kind of, you know, motivated me, and, um, you know, basically gave me a couple opportunities on his program, and so, um, you know, gave me, gave me back to the thought. Uh, for me, this is an extension in the world of Christian apologetics. Um, it's kind of like, you know, getting regular apologetics, kind of focus on, like, God and Christendom somehow. And then, you know, um, eventually you're like, hey, we got to get to creation. So... You know, creation was kind of the big thing, you know, trying to get evangelicals back into believing in the six days creation. But, you know, the the frontier was uh, KJV. And I think that we are making movement in that direction. I think that, you know, it, I could be wrong because of algorithms, but I do think that... Um, We've got a healthy amount of people who are still reading the King James, but there is a intellectual perspective now through the internet that is growing and gaining support. And so, um, you know, now we're, you know, really hunkering down on this stuff. Well, this is not only affecting, you know, this doesn't regard just the um, uh, King James only camp. Uh, this this affects all Bible believers, and what we're seeing is that the new evangelical position is hurtling. It is falling apart, and we are watching apostasy happen before our eyes. And there are several symptoms of the disease. I've been doing a lot of research lately into uh, Marxism and its effect on the church. And how a lot of this stuff has been plotted and planned for generations. But um, that's that's one of the symptoms. Okay. Um, 
this idea about the stability of what the text is is really at the heart of what the gospel is because when you lose the text you eventually you open the door to lose the gospels you you give the devil a foothold and if he gets a foothold you know uh, there's another here's another illustration the camel can get in the tent okay that's an old Arabic uh, fable but that's kind of uh, what's been happening. It's, it's what we're watching before our eyes. So there's two camps of thought within the King James movement. And um, the evangelical movement, which said that they believe in this idea of inerrancy. Only with that idea of inerrancy, um, it is more of a belief in some sort of Bible. Maybe it's a heavenly manuscript only. But, uh, nevertheless, as we're, you know, counting down to that, the, um, the understanding of Bible and Bible versions has had a lot of twists and turns, and I, I want to unrattle some of that. So, first of all, let's deal with the, um, the big issue. What do you do with other versions of the Bible? Other versions of the Bible, if they reflect the true text at any level, they can be used to A, evangelize, B, give devotions, and C, provide study tools. Now, the non-KJV movement um, you know, the original autographs only is only, you might say, believes that with their Bibles that you can, A, um, lead somebody to Christ, B, give devotions, and C, provide study tools. They do not believe that their manuscripts are inerrant, even though they believe in A, inerrancy, or an inerrancy. But they don't believe that the manuscripts that they're publishing, that they're selling to you at good cost, are inerrant and truly inspired. You know, they may have been derivatively inspired. But that's exactly what we believe. <laughs> okay, so there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, you're, we believe the same thing about your versions that you do. That's, a, that's an important point, okay? The... Um, you know, when we get across that corridor, then you have the uh, Byzantine manuscript eclectic types. And the Byzantine types are going to mostly agree with our text, but not completely. And they're going to open the door for the other side. So they still have the same problems. And so... What does that mean? It means they're not wandering as far off the reservation. Which is interesting because that's kind of like the evangelical position. You know, a lot of the new evangelicals were, were tutored and instructed under those in the neo-Orthodox movement. So, um, what does like the neo-Orthodox movement do? Well, neo-Orthodoxy, you know, I'm thinking in terms of Karl Barth, but you can bring up some of the theologians has a lot of similarity to the ancient church father, Origen. Both of them were universalists. Both of them believed in an inspiration that didn't, you know, work rationally. Okay, the, the Bible text becomes mysterious in nature. And that you find inspiration within the text. Um, I think they work it out a little bit differently. But that's, that is the same you know, that that's where they do agree, is the confusion of the text. And so, when you have that tainting, the problem is, is that, you know, um, you could always rip that hole up, and then it just goes further down. Um, the slippery slope is basically what we're talking about. Um, so, evangelicals can look pretty close. 
and the Bosington dicks kind of look pretty close, but they also, because they want to keep their autonomy, they end up losing their unity. And what we're seeing in evangelical seminaries today is the loss of unity. Unity is not achieved by having the biggest concert singing Kumbaya. That's the problem. They think if we got everybody together and hold hands in love, then therefore we achieved unity. I was watching a funny video called Lutheran Satire, and in that video, um, they had Pope, Pope John Paul II, or... No, 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 Pope Francis. Okay. They had Pope Francis there with kind of like the hippie Jesus message, and he got with the Eastern Orthodox, and hey, we love each other, da 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 and... You know, now we're together out of love. Yeah, and now you understand that the Pope is the head. Da, 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 you know, and all the other consent decrees and stuff. And they're like, whoa, whoa, hold, hold on. <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, some of that is kind of the basic gist of it. Um, the unity of ecumenicism is not unity, it's tyranny. Okay. Uh, we're not joining together we're chained together we don't believe any of the same things but we just have to follow the system and we don't have a choice so um, the unity that we have as believers is the unity of the text so you can interpret the text how you want but the text is the text it is the holy scripture it is the word of god it is infallible. It is authoritative. That's it. So, as you seek God, and you read his word, you tend to come up with the same conclusions because you're trying to follow God through the word. So, it becomes more achieved independently if we have come to the understanding of the unity of the text. Um, the unity of you know, organizations, oh, if we can only have a Pope, oh, if we can only have the Antichrist. Now look, if I did not believe that the Pope was the Antichrist, it doesn't change anything. Because you're still arguing the same thing. You're arguing, here's the one man that will unify all the religions together into one leader of the world. And that was the point of the papacy. So, okay, so you either got the Pope or you got the one Bible, which everybody eventually finds the KJV. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But um, in my article, What Makes the King James Special, I talk about um, Bible prophecy. I talk about the Bible. Uh, there are a lot of passages, and I've published a lot of thought that deals with the preservation of the text and the message that the inspired and errant word of God is preserved. However, how does that work? So one thing, one of the biggest signs of the success and the anointing of the King James Bible is its publishing. It has been published more than any other book on earth. Also, not only does it have that much success, but it is the major source of the world translations, okay? Um, probably slightly, it's probably the highest level of translation sources for foreign missions. I don't think most of them are King James based, but it does have the highest success. I will say that the most level is it, at least at the um, impact of the Texas Receptus and the Hebrew Masoretic text. So it, at that level, that is most of the foreign languages. And the ancient languages of antiquity also leaned towards the Byzantine manuscript types. So um, you have this continued flow of majority, majority, majority. And these are evidences everybody knows about. But what makes the King James translation itself special? So in the blog, I talk about how uh, a divine sentence is in the lips of the king, that's in Proverbs, and that the nations 
were the area, the point of origin of the languages. So the ruler of the nation is in charge uh, or sovereign over that particular language. You know, borders language culture, the language is determined by the patriarch or the leader of that nation. So um, when you look at uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you, you see the start of an old world empire. And it started with Babylon, and it stretched to Medo-Persia, and then to Greece, and uh, finally in Rome. And in Rome, we see, you know, we see the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2. You know, the head was gold. The two arms represented the Medes and the Persians. And um, I think that was silver. And then you had uh, the brass of the belly and the booty <laughs> of Greece. And then it splits off into two. And then there is um, clay mi mixes into the iron. And then it dissipates and is destroyed into thousands of little shards. And so that is the Roman Empire splitting into two after Christ. And when the Roman Empire splits into two, there is, um, you know, clay. That means the Christians are then intermixed into the Roman society. And the, uh, the destruction into all these little shards is what we see with all the little denominations. Okay. So, um, basically, um, I'm looking at that as a consistent set of prophecies. I also, um, let's see here, am looking at, um, you know, English has a strong heritage. You start off with um, the patriarch of uh, Tarshish. And then you start to see um, how uh, the British Isles, what we know them as, they had other names, but they used to call the land Tarshish. The British Isles um, had a working relationship first with Tyre, which was located above Israel. And then, of course, not only um, them, but the Jews. The, the Tyre, they were called Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians had their shipping department. The Jews naturally got along with the shipping and started working with that system. And we've discovered linguistics of the ancient British that have pieces of Hebrew in it. And a lot of other archaeology is unearthed a working relationship not only with Britain and the Phoenicians, but also with the Jews. And then during the first century, um, I believe that there is some weighty evidence that Joseph of Arimathea in the Bible actually escaped to Britain. And then the first church was started in Britain within the first century. And it was unique because all of the other churches in New Testament times had to hide in caves and hide from the public. But this church was above ground because the, uh, the ancient British, I think they were also called the Cassarites, okay? But um, yeah, the, these ancient British, they, um, they tolerated the, the early Christians and even celebrated them at times. And um, so you have that, you have the legends of Joseph and Matthew. And then um, by the second century, the first king over in Wales, um, Linus, he was the first king to have converted to Christianity. So that was a big deal. And then uh, many centuries later, you have Alfred the Great, who decides to take the English language and translate it. Uh, or actually turn it into published writing. So um, the English language is developed at that point. Obviously, they're struggling with um, forms of Catholicism there. 
They had non-Catholic Christianity there too, though. Um, man, I have to remember back. Uh, the Chaldees. And so um, these groups were separate from the Roman Catholicism. And then um, you have William Tyndale. You know, may God open the King of England's eyes. And King Henry VIII separates from Rome. And then um, there are some Protestant, along with Catholic, but there are some Protestant royal royalty coming after that. And finally, King James uh, unifies the territory by unifying the scriptures with the authorized King James Version. Now, the Rugmanite knows that there's something special about the King James Bible. However, the error is in what the King James Bible actually is. The King James Bible is a translation, and a translation is not a copy, it's a translation. A copy we think of uh, in this term is a collation, taking the manuscripts and trying to unify them so that we can get it right. The process of collation did not end till later, and that confused a lot of people. But the Elsevier Brothers edition of the Texas Receptus, by the way, it's the one that they actually called it, the Texas Receptus, and they did declare that it was free from all errors. Um, that is the perfect New Testament. Okay, it's just perfect. The um, Hebrew uh, was a manuscript, the Ben Kaim uh, Masoretic Text. You know, these are, you know, the basics. But now we're looking at this and we see that uh, there's something special about the nation. We also know Isaiah 28 that um, the Israelites had a curse upon them that they would hear the stammering tongue. That basically um, they would see the people of God and the spirituality of God being worshipped among the Gentiles instead of the Jews. Okay, and so as a result of that, the word of God would go Gentile, okay? And so why not have a Gentile text that is not under the New World Order, but is classically coming from the kingdom, uh, the kings and the patriarchy? So from that point, we have the uh, uh, erection of the uh, authorized version, okay? And um, it was recognized as one of the greatest pieces of English literature ever. So, you know, it has a huge amount of impact. And once you have come to this point, okay, understanding those prophetic principles, then it's okay to move to another one. And that other one that really seals the deal you have to understand, is not a predicted prophecy. Okay, so that's not what we're trying to establish. But just like the Jews, when they were looking for the Messiah, they had to go line upon line, they had to find prophecy, 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 and stack them all up, making a cumulative case. So in this case, there is a type of prophecy that we call typo typological prophecy, and it points out a special time. It is a fulfillment, but it's simply not a prediction. A good, uh, for instance, would be uh, in Matthew chapter 1, Out of Egypt I called my son. This was a typological fulfillment of Hosea chapter 11. Out of Egypt I have called my son. That was referring to Israel. But Israel did fail. So if Israel failed, in fact, that's where we get the Septuagint, this Egyptian text, right? But if, if Israel has failed, then what do we do? Israel, like Jesus, went down to Egypt as a toddler and was brought out of Egypt, left Egypt. And they said, out of Egypt I have called my son. This is to say 
that where Israel had failed, Jesus will not. That's typological prophecy. And so in Hebrews 9, I believe, it talks about the time of Reformation. And that was referring to, you know, the slavery of the law in the sacrificial system of the meats and the drinks. Well, there you have that bondage until the time of Reformation. But yet, the mass, the sacrificial system, was putting Europe under bondage, the Holy Roman Empire, until the time of Reformation. And then that points out, okay, that's why they called it the Reformation. So, the time of Reformation and the Reformation Bible obviously will culminate in the authorized version. So, what about these other Bibles? Well, if they are based upon the Textus Receptus and the Masoretic Text, and they lean to a literal interpretation, then they are what we might call good enough. The uh, preface of the King James only translator, or the King James translators, was exactly that. They said these are good translations, but we want to make a good one better. All right, so the authorized version is better than all those other versions at the level of translation. It can tell you the meaning of the text. I believe it tells you the complete meaning of the text. Whenever there is an area that you say, well, hold on, but what about this word? You don't get the full thing out of it. For instance, baptism. Baptism is a transliteration. So for me, in my reasoning, I felt like it was always better if they had said immersion. Okay? Flat out. I also think that when we talk about the divine name of God, I go with Jehovah, but I think it ought to be consistent. Well, the fact is, is that while we can find an area where, okay, this might be better in this place, the fact is that you can get the full meaning of the text. If you just look at all these surrounding verses. So we know that baptism is by immersion. Okay? You go through the text on baptism, and it'll be obvious. When they're taking people down, and they're taking people up, and they're coming up out of the water. And that the water symbolized death through Noah's flood. That's immersion. Okay? So... Um, this becomes obvious when you understand the fullness of the text. And so, yes, there's good things about them. There are things that you might not understand. And you can find fault with the King James, except for, you know, the simple fact that it's... The issue is just that you don't understand it. You know? Um, so, you know, if you stick with the text... Even though you can, you know, what we call tithe the mint. You can say, well, hold on, I don't, I don't agree with that, or I don't agree with that spelling. There's a lot of people now who are angry about which spelling do we use, which grammar do we use. Okay, and there's like, there's different editions of the KJV, and therefore they contradict themselves. Well, you're talking about letters. You're not even talking about words. Maybe you'll find a word here or there, that, they, or whatever. But when you get to the context, then it's conveying exactly what it needed to do. So, a lot of people got confused when it comes to collation about the Scrivener text. Because it said it was going exactly with what the King James said. I don't think it accomplished that. I think there are differences from Scrivener to what the King James writers were choosing as far as their text type. But that did not matter because the King James Bible was set to be a translation. The authorized translation. The one recommended for all English-speaking people. That's great. But the job of collation was fulfilled later but not 
not not now. <laughs> it was fulfilled in 1630 with the Elsewhere brothers. This is it. And its job was to have that perfect translation. Uh, not the translation. It was to have that perfect collation. The collation doesn't matter to us without translation. Because, you know, we still have to not only have the right words, but also we have to get past the mental barriers. If you're thinking all your life in one language, and this is written to people thinking all their life in another language, then there's some other issues beyond just getting the words right. So with the King James, we believe that that understanding came to a point and that's it. And so what it does, it gives the normal reader the authority of the Word of God. And if they've studied it enough, they can correct any theologian because they have something bigger than a theologian. They have God's Word. And um, so that's kind of like the important nutshell. Uh, take it, read it, let it sink in, and give me your thoughts. Catch you later.